Hi, I'm Eric Beard and I'm back with the second part of my shoulder series. This is going to be part two of seven and what we're going to talk about here is range of motion, some of the specific joints that are involved in the shoulder complex. Last time we went over kind of general motions and talked about the shoulder complex in its entirety, uh, discussing the importance of the thoracic spine, the scapulothoracic joint, the glenohumeral joint, the acromioclavicular joint, and um, the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, as a complex together, an integrated unit. Now let's talk about, in isolation, uh, how many degrees range of motion we should have approximately each section. So if we're gonna start off, one of the areas that's oftentimes ignored, and I, I mentioned this a little bit in the last video, is you're going to have some movement at the sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint. So the clavicle will move. When you're talking about movement to clavicle, you might have some um, retraction as it comes back towards the body, or protraction goes forward away. So retraction, uh, protraction is away and then retract, come back to the body. You can have somewhere around 15 to 30 degrees of retraction or protraction in either direction when you're talking about the clavicle. Uh, when you're talking about uh, elevation and depression, you're gonna get about 10 degrees of depression at the clavicle and about 45 degrees of elevation. So there's a good amount of movement. And when you're talking about that kind of posterior rotation, you're gonna have somewhere around 10 to 45 degrees of rotation that you're going to have from there. And the key point that this joint just doesn't move on its own is there's going to be movement involved with the scapula as well. So as the scapula moves, so moves the clavicle. And if we have a forward head posture, that sternocleidomastoid muscle comes down and locks down this joint, the sternoclavicular joint, you're going to cause your chromioclavicular joint to move more and cause some more trauma. So those are some movements that you're going to observe at the clavicle. When we're talking about more about the glenohumeral joint, when you're going into flexion, you're going to have somewhere between 165 and 180. It would seem 160 makes the most sense out of the research that I've shown, but 160 degrees of pure sagittal plane movement, the glenohumeral joint, before you're going to have excessive movement of the scapula or compensations through the lower thoracic or the lumbar spine. Um, so when you're talking about the other sagittal plane movement, so that was just flexion. When we look at extension, you're going to see somewhere between 35 to 60 degrees of extension purely in the sagittal plane without the scapulothoracic joint moving. Most people really don't have that. They're really adhesed or bound up in here in the posterior aspect of the shoulder. That posterior capsule of ligaments is really bound up. They cannot extend very well. And what happens when they go into extension, the head of the humerus pushes forward and traumatizes that anterior capsule of the shoulder. When we're moving in the frontal plane, we'll do this um, without the skeleton for a moment, we look at abduction, we should have somewhere around 180 degrees of abduction coming like this. And of that 180 degrees, you're actually going to get about two thirds of the movement from the scapular thoracic joint and only about a third of the movement from the glenohumeral joint. So as someone lifts the arm up to the side, there's this tremendous amount of upward rotation that we should see as you're getting this movement. We're looking for some rhythm on the scapular humeral rhythm. So the scapula is moving, the, at this point the clavicle is moving as well as the humerus is moving. So if someone goes through abduction, we're getting fully two thirds of the movement coming from the scapulothoracic joint. The clavicle must be moving as well. <clears throat> and yes, the glenohumeral joint moves. One of the things that happens is the scapulothoracic joint doesn't move. We move the glenohumeral joint and we have that pinging or impingement. And we'll come back and talk about dysfunction or impairments a little bit more. Let's just stick with the range of motion now. When we're looking at the glenohumeral joint, particularly as horizontally abducted position, passively we're looking for about 90 degrees of external rotation and about 70 degrees, that's not 70 degrees of internal rotation, I know that's active. So for someone who's lying down on the table, their arms should go back to 90 degrees and they should come forward to 70, it's not quite 70 either. Um, but we'd like to see that ability to rotate from that horizontally abducted position. So we've talked about the kind of components of the shoulder complex, the, the base of the thoracic spine, the cap of the cervical spine that relate to this. We've talked about the different bones that make up this section. Now we're discussing the joints and some of the movements and the planes of motion that we'd like to see. We've talked about the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint, the scapulothoracic joint. When studying these, I've found it actually helpful to repeat the names because it's basically Latin and Greek, it's a different language, but you have the sterno, uh, the sternum and the clavicle clavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint with the acromion and the clavicle joint, the scapular thoracic joint where the scapula joins the thorax or by the thoracic spine, the glenohumeral joint where the uh, humerus joins uh, that glenoid fossa. 
Those are big parts of the shoulder complex. Those are the major ranges of motion that we'd like to see. And if someone has a deficit in these ranges of motion, a few things could happen. We're going to cause trauma at other joints, or we're going to wear down, or we're going to cause excessive movement um, where you shouldn't have, and that's bad news for everyone that's involved. So this is number two out of about seven videos that I'm going to go over. Thanks for watching. My name is Eric Beard.